Now we're going to make a proclamation as we always do, God helping us. This proclamation is taken from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 and verse 16. You might be interested to research that from the beginning of chapter 4, verse 7 to the end of the chapter, the word love as an adjective, a noun or a verb occurs 28 times in those verses. We're not going to quote them all, but we're going to quote some of them. You're going to have to wipe that for me, sweetheart. I think you can do it later. I can recite without looking. In fact, I can read a little bit, but it's not so easy. Where are we now? Beloved, let us love one another. For love, love is, is of God, God. and, and every one who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God. And God, God in, in him. him. Thank you for helping me. I'll take these All things. right, now you can wipe those and pass them back to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I tend to get emotional. It's not through desire, because I was brought up not to be emotional. If ever anybody was trained in the school of the stiff upper lip, it was I. I won't go into all my background, but I'm from a military family. And I was educated in boarding schools in this country from the age of nine through the age of 25. And emotion had very little place in our lives. Indeed, as a family, it was a good family, but love was something we never discussed. I came to know the Lord Jesus on the last Thursday night in July 1941 in an army barrack room in the middle of the night I had a dramatic personal encounter with Jesus Christ which totally and permanently changed my life I am not perfect but I am different from what I was before I met Jesus Twelve years later, in 1953, when I was pastoring a small assembly in Bayswater in London, about 2 a.m. one night, the Lord woke me up and spoke to me audibly. The only time in my life that I've actually heard God speak to me. And I have never forgotten one word that he spoke at that time. I will quote a little of it, but not all of it. There was no preamble, no introduction, no explanation. He simply said this, there shall be a great revival in the United States and Great Britain. Then he told me something about my personal ministry, which I will not quote, and he ended with these words, but the condition is obedience in small things and in great things. For the small things are as great as the great things. I have never doubted God spoke those words to me, and 40 years have now passed, and I was reminded in the prayer room before we came in of Caleb, and I told the brother who reminded me it was unusually appropriate, because Caleb said, 40 years have passed, but I intend to go in to the inheritance. That's my intention, too. 
Now I believe God is going to send a great revival. He's not going to revive the whole of Britain, but he's going to revive the church in Britain. And that will impact the whole nation. It's easy to prophesy revival. I've heard one or two prophecies given that really were self-defeating. Because just to say there is revival or there will be revival tends to leave people feeling, well, I don't have to do much about it. But that's not true. I believe there will be revival when God's people meet his condition. It's not an unconditional promise. And in the messages that I hope to bring to you this week, I pr propose to deal with seven issues that we have to face if we really expect revival. Uh, since about 1991, God spoke to Ruth and me and said, I don't want you to go anywhere except when I send you. Before that, we would accept invitations and go. We were always prayerful. But God has limited us now to going only where he sends us. And uh, I believe he has sent us here. So tonight, I'm going to deal with the first of what I call the seven issues. I'm not going to give a title to it. I was asked to give a title by the man who does the recording, but I'm not going to make that title public. I'll let you discover it. I want to turn to start with to Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. <laughs> What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As I understand that, what Paul is saying is God has never expected us to achieve righteousness by keeping the law of Moses. The law of Moses was perfect. It was God-given. The fault is not in the law. The fault is in us. But because we could not achieve righteousness by keeping the law, God provided an alternative way through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus himself was the only Jew, I believe, whoever perfectly kept the law of Moses. And ultimately, he gave his life as an atonement for the sins of all those who had broken the law and also for the sins of those who had never been under the law. So we are not required to achieve righteousness by obeying the law of Moses. Can you say thank God? Because the law of Moses was pretty tough. And yet God said it's perfectly possible to do it, but none of us did. So what is the alternative? This is the issue that I want to raise tonight. What is the alternative? If we're not required to keep the law of Moses, how can we achieve righteousness with God? The theme of Romans is righteousness. In Job chapter 9 verse 3, Job asked a question out of his perplexity and misery how can a man be righteous before God? And Job's friends, if you can call them friends, ridiculed the idea that anybody could ever be righteous with God. But many hundreds of years later, God gave his answer. How can a man be righteous with God? And the answer is found in the epistle to the Romans. The righteousness of God, which is revealed by faith to faith, is described and fully unfolded in the epistle to the Romans. So God says you're not required to observe the law, but Paul says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We are not required to observe the law, but we are required to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. Now that word in Greek is dikaioma. The Greek word for righteousness is dikaiosuni. So dikaiosuni, righteousness, is a kind of general concept. Dikaioma is a specific outworking of it. The same word is translated or used in Revelation 19 when it says, the fine linen of the saints is the righteous acts of the saints. So the word we're talking about is righteousness in action. Righteousness worked out. Righteousness made, a pra made practical. And this we are required to observe. Let me read those words again. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. That raises a question of vital importance for every Christian, which is, what is the righteous requirement of the law? What is it that we are required to fulfill? We're not required to keep the law of Moses, but we are required to keep the righteous requirement of the law. And the theme of my message is simply the answer to the question, what is the righteous requirement of the law? And I am simple-minded enough to believe that it can be answered in one word of four letters. How many of you know the word? Love, that's right. Love is the righteous requirement of the law. Now, we are expected to observe that. We are not required to keep the entire law of Moses, but we are required to observe the righteous requirement of the law. Let me give you just a number of scriptures that confirm what I've said. We'll turn first of all to Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 and following. This is a conversation between Jesus and a teacher of the law of Moses. Then one of them, a lawyer or a teacher of the law, asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice Jesus did not hedge. He did not compromise. He was absolutely clear. The two great commandments are love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he went on to say on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets represent what we today call the Old Testament. So suppose that I wanted to take my jacket off, which I don't, and I wanted to hang it up on a peg somewhere. One simple fact stands out. The peg would have to be there before I could hang my jacket on it. And Jesus said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the primary commandments that were there before the law and the prophets are the commandments to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. And then in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, Paul writes this. Oh, no one, anything. I'm not going to preach on that, but it's rather a, a demanding statement, is it? Oh, no one, anything. Don't be in debt. Oh, no one, anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the righteous requirement of the law. And then one further scripture, and we could choose many others, but in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. What is the word? I didn't hear you. Love. Say it again. Love. That's better. Now, in John chapter 13, Jesus, I would say, related his teaching to what had gone before, to the law of Moses and the Old Testament. And in John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said to his disciples, A new commandment I give you. Moses had given them ten commandments plus a whole set of regulations. Contemporary Judaism has 613 commandments, if you want to know. Jesus said, I'll only give you one commandment. That's all. If you fulfill this, that's all I ask. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. What is the commandment? To love one another the way Jesus has loved us. And then he goes on to say, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. One thing I like about Good News Crusade is that they have a powerful vision for evangelism. And I share that vision. I have evangelized many ways in many places to many people. But I recognize one thing, that no evangelist and no evangelism will ever reach the whole human race. There's only one thing that will reach the whole human race. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. That is the testimony that will reach the entire world. It is the love of Christians for one another. And then I'd like to turn to one of my favorite scriptures which isn't often quoted in 1 Timothy chapter 1 Verses 5 through 6. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. So Paul says, the commandment whether you take it's the law of Moses or whether you take it's the one commandment Jesus gave, the purpose of the commandment is summed up in one word, love. And then three conditions are given for having that kind of love. A pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. I like the New American Standard Version of that verse which says, the goal of our instruction is love. And when I first read that, it caused me to pause and think. I've been a preacher for goodness knows how long. Fifty years probably at least. And I asked myself, what has been the goal of my instruction? What have I aimed to produce in the people that listen to me? And I had to say, if it has been love, I have often failed. So those of you who are preachers, teachers, Sunday school teachers, or whatever you are that in some way has an active ministry, I want to ask you this question. What is the goal of your instruction? What is it that you are aiming to produce in the people who listen to you? If you're a pastor, what are you aiming to produce in your church? Because if you are not aiming to produce love, Paul says, everything else is idle talk or vain discussion, the NASB says. 
That's a very searching thought. I suggest to you that a great deal of contemporary Christian activity is misdirected because it is not aimed at producing the one thing that has to be our objective. And if it is aimed, frequently it's missing the mark. If you were to talk to the people who are not Christians in this country and say, what is the attitude of people who call themselves Christians to one another? Very few people would answer love. Very few. The unsaved in many ways are more observant than the saved. We get so used to a kind of religious procedure that we call Christianity that we take it for granted. This must be the right thing. This is the way everything is done. This is the way people do it. How could we do it different? But I want to say to you, and I say it first and foremost to myself as a preacher, if I am not producing love in the people who listen to my teaching, hear my tapes, read my books, whatever it may be, it's all idle talk. It's vain discussion. It's empty words. It's wasted time. I think it's a shocking consideration how much time is wasted in churches because it doesn't produce the one thing that is required of us. A righteous requirement of the law summed up in one word, love. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter gives us the primary evidence of being born again. Now, many of you here this evening would claim to be born again. I have to confess, I'm almost tired of hearing the phrase born again. Uh, my citizenship, well, I have two citizenships. One in Britain, one in America, and I have a third, too, in heaven. I have three citizenships. But I've lived most of my past 30 years or so, most of it, but not all of it, in the United States. And it is frequently claimed in, the, in America today that there are 40 million born-again Christians in America. My response is, where are they and what are they doing? Because the country is going downhill with incredible rapidity. I think the words born-again have become a cliché that can be used by people who want to be respectable but don't want to change their lifestyle. They don't want to undergo any radical transformation, but they want to think of themselves as nice people who are headed for heaven. But this is what Peter says about the new birth. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. What is the evidence that we have been born again? In one word. I didn't hear you. Thank you. Peter says you couldn't love the way you love if you hadn't been born again. But that's not enough. He says, go on and purify your hearts to, till you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And that is directly associated with the new birth. A whole lot of teaching about the new birth absolutely misses the mark and deceives people. And I'm afraid that there are a lot of well-meaning people who think they will get to heaven who will be disappointed. They use the term born again as a sort of passport Being saved is more than a change of a label. You used to sit in the church and you had on your back the label sinner. Now you sit there and you've got on your back the label saved or born again. Salvation is not just going forward in a church, shaking the pastor by the hand, 
going forward in a crusade, signing a decision card, or going through any other kind of religious rigmarole, being saved is a total life transformation which takes you from darkness to light and makes you no longer a slave of Satan but a slave of God. Amen. If there's one truth that needs to be emphasized today in Britain and the United States and in other countries with a long Christian heritage, it is that salvation isn't what a lot of people call it. And some of you here tonight who call yourself saved, frankly, you are not saved. You're mildly religious, you're a little better than some of your neighbors, but your relationship with God is very insecure and shaky. And then in 1 John chapter 4, the passage that Ruth and I quoted, we have the evidence that a person knows God. We just read two verses, seven and eight. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you plumb that statement to its depth, it's remarkable, because it means there is a kind of love that a person cannot have unless he's been born again. Only those who have been born again can have that kind of love. If all you have or I have is the kind of love that is known around the world, it's no evidence that we've been born again. And then John goes on to say, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What's the evidence that you know God? In one word? I didn't hear you. That's right. A lot of people that I know, and I deal with a whole lot of people from different backgrounds, different denominations, different nationalities, I would say if they're saved, they're saved by a stranger. Let me give you a little example. There you are in a river, sinking for the third time. Somebody plunges in from the bank, rescues you, fishes you out, puts you wet and dripping as you are in the seat of his beautifully upholstered car, drives you off to his home, takes off your dripping clothes, gives you a new set of clothes to wear, takes care of your needs, and then says, from now on, let's be friends. You know where I live. He has my phone number. You can phone me anytime you like. Come and see me. And that person never goes back to the one who saved him from drowning. I would say, saved by a stranger. Saved, but you never come to know the person who saved you. He who does not love does not know God. You may know a lot of scripture. You may have a lot of religious theory. You may be a member of a church. But if you don't love, you don't know God. And you're much the poorer for it. Because if there's one person who is really worthwhile getting to know, it's God. Now, let's turn for a moment to the connection between faith and works. And we'll turn to the epistle of James. Some people think that there was a conflict between James and Paul. I don't. I think they just stated two opposite aspects of the same truth. Before I was saved, I was a professional philosopher. And my subject was logic. And I'd like to say, just by word of personal testimony, the most logical book I have ever read is the Bible. And the most logical book in the Bible is the Epistle to the Romans. And their logic is absolutely flawless. There are no inconsistencies. They are correct all through. But let's look at James chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. 
So what James is saying, and he said in the chapter, you can say you have faith, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't express itself in what you do, it's a dead faith. You can say to somebody, be warmed and fed and have a good time, but if you don't sacrifice and give them what they need, it's just empty words. So what James is saying is, merely professing faith is not enough. He doesn't say it's wrong, he says it's insufficient. It has to be worked out by the things you do. What, what is called in the Bible works. Now, how is faith expressed in works? What is the biblical way to express our faith in works? There is one scripture. Let's go back to Galatians, one of my favorite epistles. <coughs> Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Let me say this, if you've never been shocked by what you've read in the Bible, you've never read the Bible because it is a shocking book. And it's most shocking for religious people. I think it was Mark Twain who said, it isn't the scriptures that I don't understand that trouble me, it's the ones I do understand. <laughs> Galatians 5 verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So how does faith work? I didn't hear you. Thank you. So when we have faith, but it doesn't work through love, what kind of faith do we have? A dead faith. Faith without works is dead. Faith works through love, therefore faith without love is dead. Would you dare to say that after me? Faith without love is dead. All right, now turn and say it to your neighbor on the right or the left. Faith without love is dead. You've said a very significant and far-reaching statement. You don't know what you've put your foot in. Because what it means is, you may have the most meticulously accurate doctrinal faith, dot every I and cross every T, and yet your faith may be totally dead if it isn't expressed Amen. in love. And the problem is that I think and this is merely my personal observation, the majority of church activity in this nation today is not even aimed at producing love. It's aimed at establishing certain doctrinal truths or commenting on the, the political situation or the situation in the Middle East, but there's no real... I've said this many times to people, if you aim at nothing, you can be sure you'll hit it. I don't want to seem critical, but I am British. I mean, I grew up in this nation, I was christened, confirmed, and you may be surprised to know, Ruth and I attend an Anglican church every week in Jerusalem, and we love it. I was a rebel against the Anglican church for many years. I said a lot of unkind things about them. From experience, they weren't untrue, but they were unkind. And I think... <laughs> I think God wouldn't let me get, finish my life career without putting it in right with the Anglican Church. Today, all my complaints are laid down. All my criticisms, I no, bother, no longer bother to make them. It is so easy to criticize a church. It doesn't require any cleverness. But to change a church, that is a task. So faith without love is dead. Now let me just give you a little bit for the Pentecostals, Charismatics, people like myself who speak in tongues and believe in spiritual gifts 
And I never knew there was a way to be a Christian without speaking in tongues, because when I got saved, I spoke in tongues. It took me a long while to discover there was any other kind of Christian. So believe me, if there's anybody here who believes in speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts, I'm one of them. But listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. That's startling. Have it ever occurred to you that you might be speaking not in a human tongue, but in the tongue of angels? When I was in the, the, the deserts of North Africa, after I had met the Lord, I had no Christian fellowship. I had to have fellowship with the Lord, and I used to pray many, many times in tongues. And I observed that I used one tongue which had no S sounds in it. And I've often wondered whether that was an angelic tongue. I don't, I don't know, but at least it's perfectly possible, according to Scripture, to talk not merely in the tongues of men, but also of angels. When Paul says, even if I do that and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I'm just an empty noise without love. Somebody says, is it possible to misuse the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The answer is definitely yes. Any use without love is a misuse. And then Paul goes on, although I have the gift of prophecy, and that's very popular today, and understand all mysteries and knowledge, I have the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And though I have all faith, which is another thing that's very popular today, so that I could remove mountains that have not love, I am nothing. Um, it's easy for us to think of other people to whom that might apply, but why don't we see if it applies to us? And then he goes on to say, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. And I thought about that, there are some ministers who've profited others, but it has not profited them. You can help other people, and yet be unhelped yourself, without love. And then in the next chapter, chapter 14, Paul says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So Paul is not against spiritual gifts. But he says, get your priorities right. Priority number one is not spiritual gifts, it's love. I think it is, uh, whoever translated the New Testament first recently, what was his name? No, no not telling him. Before him, it doesn't really matter. Hmm? J.B. Phillips, thank you. Thank you. See? How useful it is to have a wife in the front row. J.B. Phillips, he translates this, make love your aim. I think that's a good translation. Make love your aim. I want to say to you, while you're here in this camp, during this week, which is set apart, will you do that? Will you make love your aim? If you do, you leave here different from when you came. I want to make love my aim. Now, there are two ways, primarily, that God imparts his love to us. I just want to mention them without going into great detail. The first one is by the Holy Spirit. Revelation, um, Ro uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God into our hearts. I don't think there's any limit on God's side. He just pours out his love. The limit is on our side, how much do we receive? And I have enjoyed that experience. I have had the love of God poured out in my heart in the Holy Spirit. I'll give you just one brief example. Serving as a soldier in North Africa, 
after I had come to know the Lord. I ended up in a very remote, barren, unhospitable corner, northeast corner of what is now the Sudan. And before I got to my actual destination, which was a small military hospital on the Red Sea Hills, I was detained for a few weeks in what the British Army calls a reception station. And for the first time in three years of army life, I didn't have to sleep in my underwear because my, this reception station was equipped with three beds, with night gowns, and with everything that could make you comfortable. So as I had no patience, I thought, why not enjoy a bed, which I hadn't slept in, and wear a nightgown, rather than sleep in my underwear, which was what I was used to sleeping in. Well, one night, I began to pray for the people of the Sudan. And the, the particular tribe that I'm thinking of is called the Hadandawa. They are not attractive people. They are warlike, aggressive, they've known no religion but Islam all their lives. The men have a habit of fixing their hair with mutton fat so that it stands about eight inches above their head. There is nothing you would say would be outwardly attractive or appealing. But that night as I began to pray, God poured out his love in my heart for those people. And I couldn't even lie in the bed. I had to get up and pace up and down across the floor of the room, pouring my heart out for these people whom I didn't know and whom I had no natural reason for loving whatever. And I, if I can say this, and I hope I will not be misunderstood, as I was doing that in the darkness, I discovered that my white nightgown was gleaming. It was supernaturally illuminated. And I, I glimpsed somehow that I had become identified with Jesus, the great intercessor, just for a few brief moments. And later I had the privilege of leading to the Lord the first member of that tribe who had ever confessed Jesus Christ as Now I say that because in a little measure I understand what it means when it says the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you at the end of that experience I was still a very imperfect, immature Christian. You might not believe it, but I was often irritable, selfish, self stunted insensitive, and I easily got angry. After all that, now I'm not belittling the experience, but I want to point out to you, it takes more than that to change your character. And God has another main means to do it, his other instrument, which is, his word. And it is not the spirit alone, nor the word alone, but it's the word and the spirit working together, which has been God's way ever since creation. Because if you read the account of creation, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, God spoke. And when the word and the spirit were combined, creation took place. And that's how God works in our lives, by the Word and the Spirit combined. Now let's look at what God says about the Word. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whoever keeps his God's Word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So how is the love of God brought to perfection in us? By what? By keeping his Word word. It's not the spirit alone, it's not the word alone, but it's the spirit working with the word. And I want to give you one of my favorite scriptures just 
as we come to a close. I believe there is a, a progress in the Christian life, an upbuilding of character. The climax is love. But there are six steps to get there. Love is the seventh step. If you have a Bible before you, turn to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. The basis of everything in the Christian life is faith. But on that faith, we are to add seven successive stages of character development. The first one is virtue. I prefer to translate that excellence because it's a very broad word which has many meanings. For instance, the virtue of a horse is to run fast. And I always like to emphasize that the first evidence that you have been saved is you should become excellent. If you were a teacher before you were saved, you should become an excellent teacher. If you were a bus driver, you should become an excellent bus driver. If you were a doctor or a dentist, you should become excellent. Excellence should be the mark of Christians. First thing we add is excellence. To excellence, knowledge. Now, I don't believe that means scientific or intellectual knowledge primarily, but it means the knowledge of God's will revealed through his word. We need that knowledge to progress. Then to knowledge, in verse 6, if you're following it, we add self-control. Now, this is a virtue that is very little spoken of in contemporary Christianity. But if you do not add self-control, you will never progress any further. Because every time you're about to progress, you lose control of yourself. You lose your temper. You lose, you yield to lust. You yield to excessive appetites. You yield to ungodly emotions. You'll yield to things such as depression and unbelief, and that stops your progress. Self-control is an essential step on the total progress. And then it says to self-control and perseverance or endurance. And again, this is essential because in the process of maturing, you will encounter tests and trials and obstacles. And if you haven't acquired endurance, you'll give up. And when you give up, your progress ceases. There's a scripture in First James that Ruth and I recite. I won't recite it now. I won't ask her to recite it. But it really convicted Ruth at a certain time because she was going through a real struggle for her health. And every time one thing got better, something else got worse. And then she read in James chapter 1, we count it all joy when we fall into various trials. And the Holy Spirit convicted her, you're sinning. You're disobeying the word of God. You're not counting it all joy. And then it goes on, we count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. But we let endurance have its perfect work, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you want to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing? Then you have to cultivate endurance. There's no other way. Otherwise, every time God puts you into a process that's designed to make you perfect and complete, you give up and your progress ceases. These two things, self-control and endurance, are what I call the bottleneck. You can't get through them, you can't make any further progress. So after self-control, now we get to the really good ones, godliness. My definition of godliness is a temperament controlled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. All your reactions, 
and responses are controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the mark of a godly person is that when he enters the room, God enters with him. He carries the presence of God with him. That's godliness. But there's still two more. You've only got the number five. Number six, brotherly kindness. That means loving your fellow believers. Some of us haven't got to stage six. And I have to confess that not all Christians are always easy to love. I think I'm probably one of them. People have come to me years later and said, Brother Prince, I have to forgive you. <laughs> Other people have said, you've changed a lot. <laughs> I understood what they meant. And I had to acknowledge it was true. But brotherly kindness is not the end. There's one more, a four-letter word, love. That in Greek is agape. That means the love that loves your enemies, that loves the people that persecute you, that loves the people that don't understand you, that loves the people that are different to you. That is the climax of the Christian life. That's the pinnacle. But there's a process, and it's... There are two agents that God uses, the Holy Spirit, and you can have these glorious spiritual experiences. I've read the lives of missionaries and others who had glorious spiritual experiences. I'm thinking of Hudson Taylor, whose life I was just reading recently. But even after that glorious experience, when he was filled with the love of God, he had a lot of personal problems, and he wasn't always easy to live with great man of God, but we have to go through the process. No one is exempt. You can't get there by any other route than God's appointed route. Let's say it again. To your faith, you add excellence. To excellence, you add knowledge. To knowledge, you add self-control. To self-control, you add perseverance or endurance. To perseverance, you add godliness. To godliness, you add brotherly kindness, love of your fellow believers, and to brotherly kindness, you add love. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the pinnacle. That is the goal. That's the destination for every spirit-filled believer. Now, I have a, I don't know what I say, a vision. That would be a mistake. But I have a wish for this camp, for all of us. And I can say at the moment, I love every one of you. I don't know you, but I have the love of God in my heart for you at this moment. And my prayer, and I want to submit this to Don Double and the team, my prayer is that somehow, the love of God will be poured out on us during this week that not one of us will leave the same. I pray that a fountain of love will be opened in this camp that will flow out at the end of the week in little rivulets that reach every part of Great Britain in your lives. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right, now, I want to make a confession. Because I have learned by experience that unconfessed sin is the barrier to God's blessing. There are other barriers, but that is number one, and much most serious and the most common. You see, a lot of Christians don't realize God says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But there's an if. And you may read the Bible differently from me, but I do not find that God has ever committed himself to forgive a sin that has not been confessed. So if we want our sins confessed, what do we have to do? 
I'm for, do we, if we want our sins forgiven, what do we have to do? Are you sure? Are you willing? Could be painful. It may take you half the week to get through them. Now listen, don't start to analyze yourself. Don't probe into yourself, because the further you probe, the worse you'll feel. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Jesus said in one gospel, if I by the Spirit of God cast out demons, and in another gospel he said, if I by the finger of God cast out demons. So what is God's finger? The Holy Spirit. Let God put his finger on every area in your life that you need to confess. Now I want to tell you, having preached this message, I have to confess, many, many times I have not loved as I ought to have loved. Many times I've been critical, self-righteous, judgmental, self-centered, and insensitive. When I think back of the children that I've helped to raise, and between us, Ruth and I are responsible for 12 children, I think the thing I regret most is insensitivity. I was an only child. I had no brothers or sisters. I grew up on my own. I learned to live my life my own way. And it's taken me years to arrive at the point when I'm even aware that somebody else doesn't feel good. I also learned this, that when people come up and ask me theological questions, usually it's not a theological answer that they want. They want love. They want help. They want comfort. This theology is just a way of saying, help me. I need to be loved. Now, I want to confess that before you all, because I want to ask God to forgive me. I don't confess. I know he will not forgive. If I do confess, I believe he will forgive. Now, I want to ask you, if you would feel it appropriate tonight, that those of us who have not been as loving as we ought to have been, would stand up, confess it privately to God, and ask God's forgiveness. And then ask God to pour out his love on us in a new dimension. I'm not asking you to tell anybody else except God. But if you say here tonight, God, when I compare my love with your love, and with the love of the early church, I am just an empty vessel. Brother Don, where are you? Come stand with me. Uphold me. Now then, I want you just to, I'm going to pray a prayer and you say amen and then take off and pray your own prayer. Lord, we want to confess before you tonight as your believing people, we have failed you. We have misrepresented you. We have given the world a wrong impression of the kind of people that we are. We have not caused them to know that we are your disciples because we have loved one for another. We have often been self-righteous and critical and condemnatory and self-centered. And Lord, we've failed in many other ways. But tonight, you have spoken to our hearts. And we want to acknowledge before you, we have failed. We have sinned. We've broken the first and the greatest of all commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. And we have broken the second commandment because we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, all we can do tonight is say, we're sorry, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. Change our hearts. Send your Holy Spirit to do in us and for us what only you can do. That's your prayer. If you can identify with that, just say amen. 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 And now, Lord, I want to pray that on the basis of your forgiveness and our humbling ourselves before you, 
you will pour out your love on this camp this week in a new measure, in a new degree, that you'll open a fountain of love in the midst of us that will flow out in the lives of the people that are here to all the corners of Britain where people are longing for love. They're not wanting religion, Lord. They're wanting love. And you have chosen us to be your vessels and your channels. And tonight, Lord, start right where we are. Start with us and do whatever needs to be done to change us, we pray. In Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Amen.